<laughs> Welcome everybody to the shit radio, an unrefined podcast for the everyman. Tonight on the show, we're going to be addressing what I consider and many consider to be the greatest year of rock album releases. We're also going to discuss the upcoming 2024 NFL football season and the Oasis 2025 reunion concert. So... We're going to start off first tonight by saying hello to the fellow host of the show, Mr. Liars. How are you, sir? Good day. Good day. Pleasure to be here. Happy to be here. Okay. And that sounds like he's also going to be doing ads for Vegemite later. And we're also going to say hello to our dear friend, one of the most beloved hosts of the show, maybe the most popular host of the show. Wasted. Wasted. I see we're drinking early. Wasted, how are you? How's things in Taiwan? Some a little time to wake up. Liars. Yes, sir. 1991. A year you remember fondly, I take it. Can you uh, can you kind of uh, brief the audience on why we're considering this a uh, great topic and why we're discussing it and uh, kind of give them an idea of what the context is and what albums we're talking about? Now, I'm going to take it a couple steps further uh because we went through a couple top 50 top 100 top 10 albums of 1991 and the top 10s were pretty much the same in all of the all of the examples that we used so i'm going to be using uh the top 10 uh, albums from 1991 from digitaldreamdoor.com and we'll start at number 10. Uh, there's a band called Massive Attack. They released their album Blue, Line, Blue Lines. And that was uh, released in... They're, in a, uh, they're an English electronic group, uh, similar to another band that's on the top 10 list. I'll, I'll tie them in. April 8th, 1991, they released theirs. And then, of course, coming in at 9 and 8, are Guns N' Roses Use Your Illusion 1 and 2, released September 17th, 1991. Out of Time by R.E.M., March 12th, ninety one. Low end theory by a tribe called Quest. So they're they're kind of like Massive Attack, that electronic kind of hip hop, yeah, you know, very groovy. Uh, low end uh, by a tribe called Quest. September twenty fourth, also on the twenty fourth. Red Hot Chili Peppers, Blood Sugar, Sex Magic. Uh, Metallica released their Black album August twelfth. U two released Actung Baby November eighteenth. Pearl Jam came in uh, with their debut album Ten at number two on August twenty seventh. And never mind was the uh, consens- consensus, my apologies, <laughs> consensus number one pick was uh, Nevermind by Nirvana. This was just a, everybody knows this album. This, it was Nirvana's second album, first one to, to feature Dave Grohl on it. Uh, it was produced by Butch Vig, We recorded at Van Nuys, California, in Madison, Wisconsin, and it was also mastered in the Mastering Lab in Hollywood, California. Most of the songs on the album were written by Kurt Cobain. Uh, it was a, very much against the norm of the of the drug use and the 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 machismo and the bigness of the late 80s going to the early 90s this marked a new beginning it was anti-establishment it was anti-sexism it was alienation uh you know a lot of it was written about uh cobain's first girlfriend i didn't know this but he dated uh bikini kills toby vale so you know well it's just it's such an iconic album right and um it had like when you think of Nirvana, you think of Come As You Are, you think of Lithium, you think of In Bloom. But then there's also Smells Like Teen Spirit. And, you know, when you, there's Polly and Something in the Way and Territorial Pissings and Stay Away. Everybody knows all of these songs. 
So it's not that much of a stretch that this basically came in at number one on every single list. Now, there's some other notables that were in there, too. And this is just going into the top 50. We had Cypress Hill, Bad Motor Finger, uh, Dangerous by Michael Jackson, Temple the Dog, uh, Public Enemy, uh, Death Certificate by Ice Cube, Original Gangster by Ice T. You know, he had Lenny Kravitz, The Spin Doctors, Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, Ozzy Osbourne, Tupac, The Pixies, and Roxette. Like, when you think of these artists you think of these songs and they were all released in 1991 and i just wanted to add that seinfeld and the simpsons were both in their second season uh, of of their existence as well and feature some of the most well-known episodes of both franchises history so 1991 is a year unparalleled by anything else well, I think that you're missing some major releases there, which, you know, we got into like the hip hop talk and all that stuff. But look at it this way. You have Metallica's Black Album, which is yeah. their most popular album. That is probably I think Nirvana's Nevermind is probably more iconic for the release, but probably more commercial success has got to be Metallica's, Metallica's Black Album. Um, that came out that year. That's. You know, it's not my favorite Metallica album by far, but it's the most close. popular. It's the most mainstream. It's the one that really got them into like the MTV nonstop. Like, oh look, it's Metallica time. Soundgarden's Bad Motorfinger came out. Pearl Jam's Ten came out. Okay, we're talking. This was pretty much alternative music's grunge music peak. You have Temple of the Dog releasing Temple of the Dog. This is, you know, another thing is this. That year, they had uh, the one of the most underrated Ozzy Osbourne albums. Yeah, no More Tears comes out. Um, there's a man in the bush. In the bush. That's a fucking great song, man. It, it's, it, it was a magical time. Imagine... The, that period from say August to November of 1991, getting all these albums released, like that's the majority of them were. I mean, it's just one week after another of getting fantastic music that you're gonna still listen to uh, 30 years later. But liars, Imagine we're not that. even done yet. Skid I Rose, Slave to the Grind. We're talking the the, the leader of the uh, Swayze Express, one of the most the finest model railroad trains you'll ever find sebastian bach and skid row and slave to the grind came out and yeah. how about van halen for unlawful criminal yeah. knowledge that's right i mean dude it's non-stop you had bands like i hate green day i think green day sucks giant amounts of can't say this so just you, you can use your imagination folks what i want to say here but you know green green day they had their complunk album come out you yep. had uh, the Pixies release an album that year, too. Yep. On top of that, you had, I think, is it the first Smashing Pumpkins? Yes. All right. What about Cypress Hill's Cypress Hill? Cypress Hill. Yeah, man. That's the first one, yeah. That album I mean, changed hip-hop, man. Because it was gang- it was all gangster rap. It was Snoop and Dre and NWA and Ice Cube and it was all leading up to that. And then Cypress Hill came out and they brought weed into the mix. It's, as silly as it sounds, they brought weed into the mix and their songs were about killing people and smoking weed. Could you argo- uh, argue also that Cypress Hill was the first new metal band? Well, you know, but yeah. think about that for a second. Before there was Limp Bizkit, before there was Kid Rock, there was Cypress Hill. Cypress Hill, yeah. Oh, yeah. Cypress Hill's first two albums, man. So this this one that we're talking about and Black Sunday, released a couple years later, are, I don't know if I would call them new metal, but I can see where you're going with that because there's definitely a comparison to be made. Sure. They had like a sort of Black Sabbath horror vibe to it, as I remember. It's, like the songs would open with like, you know, rain. It was this kind of horror so vibe to Cypress my, Hill. My very favorite song by by Cypress Hill is on the Black Sunday album. It's called Talk the Hammer. And yeah, at the beginning, that that's the one with the rain and the wizard by Black Sabbath. 
and it's yeah. it's such a haunting song. It's amazing. Okay, yeah, so and yeah, Gish, Gish, the bomb. Gish was released in 1991. It is the band's first album. Just going back to so, that, just to clarify, yeah. It isn't isn't that also Green Day's first album? So you're talking Smashing Pumpkins' debut album. You're talking Nirvana's debut album. You're no, talking Nirvana's second album. Oh, um, yeah, but Bleach can go suck a dick. I mean, how many people go, oh, I know what Bleach was? Yeah, I hear you. I, I mean, hear you. realistically, like what? The fucking, oh, I had a tape cassette of Bleach. No, you got that afterwards, asshole. Yeah, you're right. You know, you're right. What, I know maybe like legally and by the uh, actual release, I'm wrong. But that's like saying, oh, no, uh, Appetite for Destruction wasn't the first Guns N' Roses album. It was what was the one before that? Uh, Live Like a Suicide. That's kind of right. like the same comparison I like to use for Bleach and uh, Nevermind. But you look at what was released then. So you have all these alternative bands, okay? You literally have the grunge bands releasing all their big ones, except Alice in Chains. That's the only band in 91 that didn't release that's part of the big grunge movement. I mean, you got Pearl Jam's 10. You got Soundgarden's Bad Motorfinger. You yeah. got Nirvana. They're all right there. But at the same time, you still have the big regular hard rock of, even though I guess Metallica, would you consider Metallica metal at that time? Or would you consider them transition to hard rock? Because by now, I think the Black Album is them transitioning from being metal to hard rock. Definitely. Yeah, with hard Bob rock. rock. Bob Rock producing him. Okay, Mark so you have the hard producer. rock albums for Uncarnal Knowledge from Van Halen. You have Use Your Illusions 1 and 2 from Guns N' Roses. You have Metallica's Black, but then on the metal side of it, you got Ozzy Osbourne's No More Tears. You know, that's that's a giant thing right there. And then, you know, then you want to talk kind of indie rock. You have R.E.M.'s most popular album of the time and the one that they won the Grammy for come out with Out of Time. And Out yeah. of Time had, you know, Losing My Religion on It, Shiny Happy People. You know, it had a lot of really popular mainstream songs. You have U2's Ak Chung Baby. Are you guys really seeing how much shit you had that year come out? It's yeah, it's was, incredible. I was thinking that it's... Do you think that it's because it's like the, like the beginning of the decade and all those bands? Like, I know Ak Chung, I know U2 and Metallica, they were all like, they did interviews... Uh, about how how they were basically gonna they needed to change like to get in to be to stay to stay like relevant so and then maybe Geffen with Guns N' Roses they were like looking at the decade so everybody's bring in the night in 1990 they were all thinking we need to get you know we need to get an album out like now to kind of you know to go forward with in the 90s so everybody's putting out their best stuff at the beginning of the decade trying to because that's how record labels think isn't it sure well let me They're ask like, you this guys 80s is over it's now the 90s we need to do something so i think that's why all these bands are bringing out their albums let me ask you this guys we're even forgetting another great album it's not my favorite tom petty album by far but into the great wide open july 1991 kids these days and people like i was you know not a teenager yet i was still a kid so I used to get the cassettes I'd steal from my dad. But you two were both teenagers, almost uh, adults. And you guys would go down to the record store. And every week, there was a new CD. Every, every fucking week, week. Because I remember, like, in 1991, there's, like, a, uh, like a music weekly paper in, in the UK called Melody Maker. Every year, they do their top 100. And I had the same thoughts that we're having now when I looked at the list. Because I I just like come out of like Appetite for Destruction. I knew about all these bands, and then I was looking down the list, and you had those, but you were also like looking at hip hop, like like you were saying. And then there was Acton Baby there, and there was like Metallica's like just gone like hard rock, you know. And there was also like there were albums that were huge in the UK, but maybe not that well known around the world, like Bandwagon S by Teenage Fan Club, and yeah. there was like Screamadelica. Scream of Delica is on that list, uh, Primal Scream. That's like a yeah. huge record in the UK. And also Jesus and Mary Chain. That's Atomic Dustbin. Uh, yeah, I mean, I had that record. Yeah. So when yeah. I was like going down the list, there was all like the stuff 
like Nez Atomic Duskin was like the stuff you got into when you were like a really young, like a teenager. Okay. And then there was like Michael Jackson bought out Dangerous. That's right, Dangerous. So, you, so you're like going down the list and it's got it's got everybody that like you you like right that year, but there's also all these other bands coming through and those hip hop artists, like you said. So, so we're not even that, talking pop guys. I mean, there's plenty of country albums and pop albums that were released. I mean, I just don't remember any other time in existence that this many great albums came out at one point, especially in, you know, a matter of months. Cause these weren't like, Oh, you know, really, you know, spread out from January to December. Majority of these were all from what, what were you saying earlier? Liars like September to November, September to November were the majority of those albums. Yeah. I was thinking about it, and uh, I was thinking about, like, the only one I can remember is 1968. If you, if you look up 1968, it's like, uh, it's Beggar's Banquet uh, by Rolling Stones. It's like the White Album uh, by the Beatles. That's, 1968 is also a really good year. But we haven't seen anything like it since. I mean, guys, look That's at it this way. We are just went over Temple of the Dog, which, I mean, I think superior to Soundgarden in every single way. And Temple of the uh-huh. Dog came out then. You know, you got Hunger Strike, Say Hello to Heaven, Pushing Forward Back. I mean, you're talking some really, really crazy good shit that was coming out. And it was just nonstop. And, like, this was all over MTV. This was rock radio, like, ruled the airwaves. Everyone was listening to music. I was in elementary school then, but we all used to talk about music. Nothing like that exists anymore. Nothing and it hasn't like existed. Exists. Yeah. Basically, that I can't year, remember the last time. That year, 1991, it defined the next 20, 30 years, didn't it? Because Nirvana and, like, I don't think Faith and More on it, but Nirvana, Faith and More, like you said, rap, like hip-hop, that created, like, new metal. So it all kind of, it kind of snowballed. But they're all, like, influenced by those 90s bands. So it was so, basically, 90s was huge for, like, rock. And then yeah. that had, like, a carry-on effect. And it never really came out of that, you know. The band another big another band album big that now. was released in 91, it wasn't Faith No More, but it was Mike Patton's side project, Mr. Bungle. So it had that uh, oh, yeah, influence yeah. Of, of Faith No More. And it, Mr. It was Bungle the, as well in 91. Mr. Bungle was absolute madness. The the It was <laughs> madness as, as, a, as an album. But, uh, you know, it's still, I mean, if you, it, it's just, it. I, I keep using these words. It, it, they're iconic. All of them. Every single one of them is iconic. You know, yeah, Mr. Bungle is, ba- is and Faith and More basically invented new metal. Yeah, yeah. Every new metal art artist like always says like, oh, Mike Patton, you know, or Faith and More, because it's metal. You know, it's Black Sabbath rather than Chili Peppers. Chili Peppers are like funky rap, yeah. So yeah. other bands came out of that, and maybe they also like that. But it was it's always Faith No More. Like, I know, I bet you Slipknot like Faith No More. <laughs> You know, it's funny, guys. We're not even talking about this right now, but uh, we asked Franz earlier. Franz is not with us because we record uh, uh, at a time where he's asleep. It's like 3, 4 o'clock in the morning, Franz time. But he brought up something earlier, too. We're forgetting about Queen's Innuendo album. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I was saying, is that even though the list had all the bands, there were new bands, and there were the bands that you knew about, and then and then there were the old, all the old bands, we're bringing out albums as well. Like, are the Stones on it? The one year that the there, Stones Flash didn't Point. release an album. Nope, Flashpoint came out. Oh, yeah, I had that. I, that's you when I was what? buying CDs in, around the nine in the 90s. I bought every CD that was <laughs> available. I'm Flashpoint probably the like biggest fan of this hit. guy of anyone who listens to the show or, you know, is in the communities that we're in or whatever. But Lenny Kravitz's Mama Said came out that year, too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, Lenny, Jesus. Lenny Kravitz was on, like, Top of the Pops in the UK. But it wasn't just, you know, we were, we've were we talked about rock music, and I guess we can continue on that, but Boys to Men's Cool High Harmony came out that year, which, that was huge. I mean, Ice-T's, Ice-T's original Gangster came out that year, which is, like, the king of, one of the king of raps, one of the top rap apples that, uh, Jesus, I yeah. cannot speak tonight. One of the top rap albums ever. Seals Seal came out that year. NWA. Um, so NWA's released an album that year, but I can't say the name of it because it will get um, censored. 
it's you say it backwards, right? It's at Phil Verzagen. Okay. <laughs> I, rem- I, t- I remember this. I remember the controversy when this album came out, because because of the title, and how they were kind of being cheeky about it, saying it's you know it's it's not what you think the album title is is Afil for Zagan, right? And they were laughing about it, and it was it was a big it was it was a big f you to the record industry at the time because you know people were still shocked by stuff and people were still you know, on their moral high horse at the time. And, uh, you know, they, you just couldn't, you know, they were coming off of, of two live crew where they just were in everybody's face and NWA comes out and they're like, well, hold on. If you guys are doing this, we're going to do this. And it's kind of like in their face and they were laughing about it. It's yeah, man, it's. <laughs> well, Lars, it's, I'm, I'm going to continue. I'm going to continue. Yeah. You want to know why? Cause yeah. anthrax released attack of the killer bees. Beauty. I'm I'm still going right now, folks. Slick Rick released The Ruler's Back, which any of you uh, OG hip-hop fans will know. The Ghetto Boys released We Can't Be Stopped. <laughs> hey, don't hate on the Ghetto Boys, dude. I love the Ghetto Boys. That's some good <laughs> shit right there. Hey, listen, Marky Mark and the Funky Bunch released Music for the People. All right? I, I don't know. Maybe <laughs> we should just end it there because, I mean, I don't know if we're going to top that. Is it just our <laughs> age, though, uh, that year? was the year that we would be paying most attention. But I think it did define the next two decades, three decades. So it's not just the fact that we, we were there at the time and they were all and those bands. I think it's it's the record companies and the bands wanted to the you know, the the nineties, they wanted to make an impact on the nineties. They could all see the like money coming in. You know. A new decade. I don't know if it happens in did it happen in two thousand? Like two thousand one. Where there are a load of bands like trying to like make their make their mark, you know, at the beginning of the the zeros. Okay, I mean, how that's, about that's really when Corn came out, isn't it? Corn released their well, debut the, somewhere around there. Speaking of Corn, let's talk about Public Enemy releasing Apocalypse '91: The Enemy Strikes Back. Better believe it, man. Scarface released uh, my my Mr. Scarface is back. I'm still going here, boys. Uh, we got a Warren Zevon release, Mr. Bad Example, which wasn't one of his memorable ones from my knowledge. Um, Ice Cube's Death Certificate. Yeah. <laughs> Big Daddy Kane. <laughs> Prince of Darkness. Good Lord. Uh, this Big one's Daddy. for our old, depart- our old departed friend, JB. The Grateful Dead Infra- Infrared Roses. Stevie Ray Vaughan released The Sky is Crying. Uh, they had everything. released Pandora's Box. Did they really? And L- L7 brought out their debut album. Okay. So L7's debut album came out. Aerosmith's Pandora's Box came out. Liars, I don't know, because I'm pretty sure that Wasted's not going to be digging this as much as me and you. Tone Loke's Cool Hand Loke. You know, is it Funky Cold what, Medina? What, they play that song all the time on the radio up here. My wife loves it, and uh, it, dude, like, like dude, that's your wife just, kicks just, ass. <laughs> that's just the staying power of this music, man. This is thirty three, thirty three years later, and Tone Loke is still being played on the radio, man. It's fucking insane, man. Is is Vanilla Ice on that? No, I think Vanilla Ice was the next year or the year before. And Live released their second studio album. The Prince is definitely on there. Prince is on here, yes. I just, I cannot believe, like, how much shit came out. And by the way, it looks like that Tone Loke album was not the uh, the big popular one. This one only had All Through the Night with <laughs> El DeBarge. <laughs> so, El so DeBarge. Yeah, I think the one we we were looking for is uh, loked or loked after dark. So that's that's loked the one after, that was a good one. Loked after oh. dark. Who knew that Tone Loke made so many albums? Oh, dude. You know, speaking of, <laughs> dude, ahead. it's just insanity right now. Now with all these albums that we're talking about, guys, like, what would you say are the ones that like you're like this is amazing? Which ones would you say? Oh, these sucked. Like, what would you say is the most overrated album from 1991, guys? 
I don't mean, think you're gonna like my opinion, my my choice. I'll let Wasted go first, then I'll tell you mine because I don't think you're gonna like it. I think like N- Nevermind is probably the most like overrated because it's so highly rated. <laughs> you know, because it, it is they're just simple songs, aren't they? Uh, it's Very not simple. as mind blowing as they say. I mean, Smells Like Teen Spirit is like did like blow the doors off the whole thing at the time, but it's not like it's not like uh, a really like. I remember my art teacher at school, like, saying that it's all been done before. You know what I mean? Which is true. So it wasn't anything innovative. There were a lot more albums on there that are more like, like even the rap stuff. It's more kind of interesting than, than uh, never mind. Uh, underrated, I would just say, uh, Primal Screams, uh, Scream Delica, because it's so, like, especially American audiences don't know it at all. Yeah. I don't think, but it's a like a it's not it's not really a rock album, but it has something of that in it. But it's kind of like um, I always like likened it to uh, change. You ever hear like Changes Bowie? It's like a compilation compilation album yeah. of all his hits, and everybody likes it because it's just they're just like beautiful songs. Yeah. And I remember there were like people at college that when they heard Screamadelica. These weren't, they were just like, they didn't like music. They didn't even go out. You know, they weren't like clubbers or anything. When you hear it, you can have that playing in like a, a, a shoe shop, you know, and it just, it sounds amazing. You know, it's almost like the, it's almost like uh, the Beatles remix album or something. You know, it's, it's so futuristic and ahead of its time, but it's also so easy to understand. And when you listen to it, it's, you can have it playing in your garden at a garden party. I don't know. Scream of Delica is like an amazing album, uh, just creatively. Uh, and my favorite, I don't know, it's probably of that in that list. It's not all the the bands that are like uh, my favorites probably came before. You know, there's not much hair metal on there either. No. So my my favorite albums are not on there. But like the the Jesus and Mary Chain album. Uh, that's probably one that I listen to a lot. Well, since I'm going to be the asshole here and uh, Lars is trying to hold back and I, I kind of know where he's going to go for most, uh, cause I know him most overrated and uh, first off, fuck you. Shotgun blues. Isn't that bad. Um, <laughs> let me say this. And it, this is just my personal opinion, but I think Soundgarden is one of the most overrated bands in the history of rock. I think Chris Cornell has one of the greatest voices in the history of rock, but Soundgarden songs are just depressing and whiny and they're boring. I don't like Soundgarden. I never have. I love Audio Slave of Chris Cornell. I think he's a fantastic musician. I just don't like Soundgarden. I just think they suck. So that's going to be my most overrated. I just can't fucking stand them um most underrated i'm probably gonna say lenny kravitz mama said because i love lenny kravitz and i think that's a really good album it's one of his best um i almost want to say red hot chili peppers blood sugar sex magic but i know it's not underrated like i know so many people listen to it so i can't really say that so i think underrated i'm gonna go with lenny kravitz uh my favorite album and i'm just gonna lump them in as one because it's just the same album. They just released them separately because they wanted more money. Cause you know, capitalistic America, I still love use your illusions. I still think it's overall amazing. Uh, I'm a GNR fan, obviously. And I think that it's their second best release after appetite by far. And I know they're not all winners on there, but I enjoy it. All right, liars. It's your turn. We actually have friends as picks for, the most overrated and underrated albums uh, of 1991. He mailed them in. He was really excited to get in on this one, too, because it's such a cool topic. So um, underrated album for him is uh, Innuendo by Queen. And probably the most overrated album was Massive Attack, uh, Blurred Lines, and U2, Ak Chung Baby. I can't really disagree with those choices either, right? They're, they're pretty bang on. Okay, so for my... Most underrated album. Uh, I'm. It's hard for me on this one, but I think I'm gonna go low end theory for for uh, from Tribe Called Quest, just because it's such a phenomenal album 
and it just you start it from one side play it right to the other side it's just one big groove and you just sit and chill and it's just good listening music um fantastic album by a tribe called quest uh introduced me to their rest of their um to the rest of their discography so uh, i think that album is underrated most overrated album and i i fucking hate this album just straight up i fucking hate this album is the black album i think it's a terrible album and the, it marked the the signal it was marked the end of uh of metallica metallica changed with that album you had kill em all which is okay i, I don't really like kill em all it's it's a good thrash ma- album but I, I don't really like it then you got ride the lightning master of puppets and justice for all and when i think of metallica that's what i think of i think of that metallica and then that black album came out and all of a sudden they're playing songs like unforgiven and enter sandman this is they're no different than nickelback they're radio rock and it's garbage uh so and be- then be- before you move on i just want to ask you do you think that the fact that cliff burden you know because he died was replaced by Jason Newstead, that that really played instrumentally in how they changed their whole sound. And the fact that Dave Mustang, who was from the earlier albums, you know, the first two, and then I think he's even credited on some of Injustice for All, do you think that the the whole band kind of shifting to where it was just really Kirk, uh, Jason Newstead, and Lars now just running the whole show and not having Cliff Burton in there to throw more stuff in there and not having carryover stuff from you know when dave mustang was in there do you think that really changed the band in general because there's definitely a difference between pre-black album and post-black album metallica so i think cliff burton obviously played a huge role in metallica and that their sound on those albums that he was on and then jason newstead i think was perfect in the band and he was great uh on injustice for all amazing what you were talking about before they're wasted about changing their style and changing their sound that was uh metallica and they i just recently heard an interview or read an interview with them about how they collectively uh including newstead because he was on the black album i want to i i the, the difference between injustice for all and and the black album i can see why they got rid of them after uh, it, it just wasn't the same band. But Jason Newstead was with them all the way till I want to say St. Anger, dude. I thought he wasn't on Justice for All, but he was on he was on Injustice for All, but he was with them all the way until geez. Newstead was with them he was on yeah. load and reload. So yeah, he didn't leave until two thousand one. I I didn't realize that. My mistake, I didn't realize that. I thought he was out after the black album, but I guess not. I think um, like uh, Dave Mustaine always claims to have like been he wrote a lot of the songs or parts or something on Kill 'Em All or the early stuff. Yeah, Kill 'Em yeah, All. He, he was the lead guitar player. Yeah, and then like Lars is the one that instigated this kind of like these commercial moves to stay relevant. I think uh, he was always convincing Hetfield that you know we need to like you know leave thrash behind and like you know because Lars really liked Guns N' Roses as I remember. So I think yeah. they're trying to stay relevant, and it works like commercially. Like they got all those ballads, MTV. You know, you need you need ballads and uh, to be on MTV, don't you? Thrash doesn't really work on MTV that well. Do you so know what's Megadeth funny about Metallica? Right, you know, and Megadeth especially about Lars. Right. It's an observation. I want to see if you guys agree with it. You guys ever notice that Lars looks almost exactly like Phil Collins? They both play drums. Yeah. Yeah, they have the sort of bald mullet. Yeah. Which is the, which is the, the shit comb that I'm over. rocking at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> I just, you know, I, I agree with you. I, like, I think the Black Album is a really good album. I really liked it when I was younger, but I can see your point. It's definitely a change in Metallica, and I, I do think it's overrated comparably to their earlier work. So that that's pretty fair. Now, Liars, what's your yes. favorite album from 1991? It's hard. Um, I, I'm a huge Guns N' Roses fan, so I love Use Your Illusion one and two. Um, so I mean, it, it's it's a toss up between that and I mean, I still listen to Cypress Hill's first album on the regular 
uh it's i can i can sing that album from start to finish so i'm a big 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 fan of cypress hill well obviously you're teasing the audience here take it away buddy where are we He's going uh, pigs on the album well, i, I yes. thought you were going to sing for us <laughs> no, i'm not going to sing pigs uh, is well, the opening yeah. track on that album yes it is uh, wasted insane in the membrane was on the other one that was black biggest sunday. hit. that's yeah. on black sunday yeah yeah, and that's probably their biggest hit for sure. But oh, and just to correct something, because we were kind of going through the list, I mentioned that uh, that Aerosmith album. That was actually like a compilation greatest hits album. It wasn't a new release. Yeah, still, just the amount of music. I mean, dude, I can't ever think of a year that this much music came out, and it was such quality music and such industry changing music and. I don't think it was ever met anywhere close to that again, you know, in any genre. Maybe maybe country music has had a year after that, you know, maybe rap sometime in the early mid 90s might have had a year like a 93 or 94, probably more closer to 94, maybe 90, you know, somewhere in the 90s I could see rap having that, but this was definitely the last year of major rock albums. And the funny thing is I think all of us would probably agree that this is not anyone's best album. Like, from the big rock bands, this is not any of their best albums. I don't think it's Nirvana's best album. I don't think it's Guns N' Roses' best album. I think we all agree it's not Metallica's best album. It's not U2's best album. It, uh, it is. Pearl Jam. It is I can 100% argue. Slave to the Grind is 100% Skid Row's best album, though. Do you think Slave okay. to the Grind is better than User Illusion? <laughs> I've always thought Slave to the Grind is like a better album than either User Illusion's. Because user illusions one, like rely on covers. One on one. A little bit. If I'm gonna take user illusion one and two and break it down to one album and put that up against Slave to the Grind, as much as I love Guns N' Roses, I think Slave to the Grind takes it. Takes it. That's that's how good that album is, man. It's. I don't mean that like Guns N' Roses have more excess and more different types of sure. songs, but Slave to the Grind, that album is perfect. It's fucking amazing, man. It's one of the best. It's it's probably the best heavy metal album of all time, I would say. I and I'm I know like that's a lot of albums to go through, and a lot of people might be upset listening to this. But slave, you're you're right, wasted. Slave to the Grind is a perfect album. It's from start to finish, amazing. And like like w- wasted time, or say in a darkened room, isn't that mm-hmm. that that's equal to something like Don't Cry, isn't it? For sure it is. But, but like Slave to the Grind and Monkey Business are probably better like rock rock song rocker songs than anything on Usual Illusion, other than You Could Be Mine. Like if you listen to them side by side, Usual Illusion production brings it down a little bit. I think the production on on Use Your Illusion is really good. Yeah, I like the production, but it's very flat. Okay. And kind of some of the drumming sounds a little bit like uh, like a machine. Like they've got the same kind of plodding kind of drum beat throughout the whole thing. I can agree. But there's with so that, much yeah. variety there. There's definitely more variety, and uh, Axel's a better singer, and the lyrics are sort of better. But somehow, oh, oh wasted. Hold on a sec. You think Axel's a better singer than Sebastian Bach? Uh, I don't know. Like at, at that the variety. Time. Like we're not talking of, now. At the that lyrics time, in and the attitude is more like comes across more where sometimes even though sebastian Bach has higher he has a, a bigger range doesn't he and uh but he's a little bit more like not as original you're all on crack you know what i mean like sebastian Bach could be like david coverdale you know david coverdale is a good singer but he doesn't quite have there's something in axel's voice that is sort of unique i like I the comparison you just made to David Coverdale and Sebastian Bach. I think that one's pretty legitimate. But to think that Sebastian Bach has anywhere near the vocal range of Axl Rose is out of your fucking mind. I mean, you want to talk Axl Rose and vocal range, buddies, we got to go sit down and talk like Chris Cornell and Freddie Mercury. Instead of that, get the fuck out of the conversation. Maybe Lane Staley. Those are the kind of singers you can go compare Axl Rose to. Don't compare fucking Sebastian Bach screaming at a high level to fucking Axl who can, you know, I, that's, that's insanity. I don't know. I've seen, I've seen, I saw them both live in '91, and the Skid Row show. Sebastian Bach has a pretty powerful voice. He can do crazy, like, uh, 
like long screams and he can do quite a bit. I think Axel has a higher, like he does falsetto, doesn't he? Sometimes, but I just think that the Slave to Guy is like a very like commercial kind of uh, great record with hardly any filler on it. Whereas there are bits and pieces of User Illusion which are like filler that you think maybe this shouldn't be on the record, but it's still it's they're all good. So and it had a kind of wildness to it, User Illusion. I just, to it. I'm still sitting back trying to understand how Liars is comparing Sebastian Bach to Axl Rose vocal wise. I'm just like, I don't get it, but Hey, you know, people have different opinions. That's, that's fine. One thing though we were talking about is, you know, we kind of all agree that this isn't anyone's greatest album. I mean, maybe you can say 10's Pearl Gem's greatest album. It's not my favorite album. It's, you know, maybe Blood, Sex, Sugar, Magic might be Red Hot Chili Peppers' greatest album. It's not my favorite album by them. But overall, the music is just fantastic this year. I mean, do you guys agree with those kind of takes or do you guys disagree? I mean, even like Van Halen, obviously we're not going to say for on Connell knowledge matches anything from the David Lee Roth era. And it's not even, you know, 5150 from Hagar era, but it's still pretty damn good. It's a good album. Pound Cake. Remember Pound Cake? He played it with uh, a drill, I believe, at the beginning. Eddie Van Halen got that sound effect by using a drill with his guitar. Um, yeah, it's what was it? It has Van Halen's biggest hit on it, is doesn't it? Right now, is that that can't be their biggest hit, dude? That that. I'm going to do a quick dive on that song because that song was absolutely mad. It was everywhere. It was in, it was in advertisements. It was on TV. It was, you know, the Van Halen was singing it. I just can't think that's their biggest hit. I mean, I know it was everywhere. It was a great tune, but I, I just can't think that's their biggest hit. Jump must be their biggest hit. I've heard of that one. <laughs> yeah, I've heard of that one too. <laughs> Thanks, Wasted. <laughs> no, huge. just the music, the music in general is just, fantastic and i don't think we're ever going to see another time like that i know we're repeating ourselves by saying that but i think it's it needs to be stated um it's such a drop off afterwards like all the bands like they had some good albums afterwards but it's never a time again where you had so much in such a short period of time and maybe the whole you know wasted has a point the music industry changed but now it's nothing i mean I get that people love Taylor Swift and like when Taylor Swift releases shit, people go out and buy it. But I can't remember anyone, you know, lining up, you know, for big giant music releases anymore. I know a lot of them happen digitally, but I just don't see the same enthusiasm and same excitement from people. And I think it's a time in the world that we're never going to get back. And, you know, for, for us that lived it, it's really cool. And especially for you guys, that was like really in your peak time. I mean, I'm really starting to get concerned about Wasted realizing that he's more of a hair metal guy than he ever was a hard rock guy. Because now I'm just picturing that Wasted was running around London back in the day with fucking spandex pants and fucking peroxide hair. But well, well Brit, Brit, pop, Brit pop was kind of like, uh, you know, the UK's version of uh, hair metal in a way. Just a load of bands that are all the same, all just trying to get on the like the the gravy train. <laughs> Of the London Dude, like, you, scene. Did you just segue that nicely? Because that's a hell of a segue. We're gonna oh, we're I'm gonna use that. That's professional. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's fantastic. That's great. Um yeah, wow. That's uh all right. So on that segue note, speaking of Brit pop and how wasted's a fucking professional, which <laughs> clearly you are, sir. Uh, Oasis, a, a Britpop band uh, from the 90s, has announced they're uh, doing a reunion tour. The Gallagher brothers have stopped fighting for the time being, or probably not for long, and they're going to be doing a stadium show in, uh, or stadium shows in 2025. Now, Wasted, I'm an American, so I know nothing about Oasis except like uh, Champagne Supernova that a bunch of assholes with like you know Beatles glasses and fucking you know bad haircuts and uh, really bad goatees would get their guitar out and sing Champagne Supernova at the streets or like parties. So like my understanding of uh, Oasis is very limited. 
Uh, you, as a native member of the United Kingdom, can you please explain to the audience why this is important and uh, who the fuck Oasis even is? Um, I think it's basically the sort of... They're basically from, like, Burnage, which is, like, some area of Manchester. It's like a council estate. So they're, they're like, totally, like, uh, like working class, you know, from a working class background. And that, that was kind of like a... At the time in 1994, which is when Definitely Maybe came out, this was kind of like a new thing, you know, in the music industry. You know, it's, it's more like a throwback to the Beatles, which, you know, they're like heavily influenced by the Beatles. Like, you know, you know, when they came out, they, they were saying that, you know, we want to be, you know, we don't want to be like better than our contemporaries. We want to be bigger than the Beatles, you know. And this is like a change in attitude from the music scene in the UK at the time. Like normally these bands, there was like the shoegazing scene, which is kind of it's all indie rock. So the most like arrogant band in the UK before Oasis was basically the Smiths. And then then you had this like new lad kind of phenomenon, a, a sort of a reaction against the, the new new man. There was this kind of ladism that was popular, you know, football as well coming into music. So you had like the Stone Roses. So when I heard definitely maybe like you basically it sounds like the Smith Smiths, you know, Johnny Marr. And Noel is a big, like, Johnny Marr fanatic. And and then it also sounds a bit like, it's like the next step on from the Stone Roses, which are kind of like a, kind of like, that kind of like dance rock indie band. Like the best, the best. They're also kind of like the Beatles, you know. But there was hundreds of bands. But the difference was, is that Oasis brought a kind of like rock, like classic rock kind of, ambitious which is not a, a, a sort of british thing you know saying that we're the best band and we're going to be fucking massive is not like a traditional that's not the way english people are you know what i mean they're all polite and it's reserved and i'm um, sorry and most musicians come from like middle class backgrounds really like sean Ryder would always say like you know musicians are all they're all plums you know they all went to oxford university to study like music you know and then then, then there was like the new new romantic scene you know, Duran Duran, this is all like pop. England was very pop, but Oasis brought this sort of like arrogant kind of rock kind of mentality, huge, you know? So when the album came out, you know, I listened to it, I thought it was really good, but you know, you've got like songs like uh, uh, Supersonic and Cigarettes and Alcohol, you know, they're, they're like rabble rousers. Uh, and and they're basically, they basically always make the same record, basically. It's all about attitude and rock and roll and being rock stars. And that was a huge change in the UK. You know? And that and they're but they're almost like professionally working class to a cartoon level. You know what I mean? That's how they are. You know? You know, when and there's people and everybody's a bit like that, you know. When you're with your mates, everybody just calls each other like, all right, cunt, you're a twat, you know, nobody says anything positive in the uk anyway nobody's nice everybody's just taking the piss out of each other and that's basically what they are and that kind of to me that kind of rub that kind of rubs maybe americans up the wrong way you know what i mean and they're not like the heaviest band you know what i mean they're not metallica they're not thrash you know and they come over as if they're hard because they're from a council estate oh you know no dude i don't think they rubbed americans the wrong way i just think they like they took your like liberal college student who wanted to go play acoustic guitar in front of Starbucks and fucking just sing champagne supernova. That's what they did. They just were like, Hey man, it's the Beatles again. Everyone let's wear these little stupid fucking glasses and have bad haircuts. And we can all act like it's the sixties again. And that's when like that whole, like, uh, I think they kind of were like in the ushering period where everyone started wearing sixties clothing again. And thinking that the, it was was like the same time, like Woodstock was redone. There was a reaction. There was that feeling. It's a little bit like Brexit now. Yeah. Back then Wasted. in the early 90s, the Brit pop, there Morning. was a kind of there was a kind of like throwback because you had bands like Def Leppard. Yeah. You had bands like Def Leppard who are from Sheffield, but they were pretending, you know, they're like dressing like hair metal and singing like hair metal. So there was I don't know why there was this kind of like throwback to 
Like, but Noel has like, you know, the bands that he likes are like the Jam and the Who, you know, they're things that, you know, from the 60s, you know, there was this throwback, but they're not like a Britpop band. You know, they're not Cool Britannia. Blur were the ones that like, Blur and Suede were the bands that the media like sort of charged up in the UK to represent this new kind of wave of British bands. Because basically American bands were just kicking like, kicking ass everywhere from the 70s and 80s and all the uk had was like uh, the smiths and the stone roses it was all very like uh, wait a second you guys had the sex pistols and the fucking uh yeah iron maiden yeah well they were bringing that back as well like there were headlines like uh oasis are the sex beatles you know what i mean they were a combination like liam is a combination of like johnny rotten and like lennon vocally so they brought that back but there's not many bands. The, most of the, the music scene in the UK is all Radio 1 and pop. And Oasis were like this kind of, basically a, a big rock band, really. Like a proper rock band, rock and roll. But you see, Noel was like smart, as he didn't go directly at the Beatles and directly at the Stones. You know, there were bands that sounded more like that than, than Oasis. But Oasis have like that kind of like um, the jam and the who elements to it so that was smart to be like is more in that area but yeah it's an indie rock they're just an indie rock band like i said like the smiths definitely maybe like I always smiths. Think- and then they started doing singles right like uh pop singles like wonder wall like you said don't don't look back in anger and then champagne supernova these are huge like popular huge hits they were having hits like seven number one albums you know all their singles are you go through their singles they've got like there's three or three or four albums where there's like three or four singles on them that were all hits and i think like, you corrected me on something so let me correct myself because i said champagne supernova is what every asshole and acoustic guitar was playing it wasn't that it was wonderwall that's what everyone like even now you know you go through any of the major cities here in the united states you're always going to find some motherfucker in front of a starbucks or at the <laughs> fucking train station playing wonderwall and acoustic guitar but every time i think of oasis it just reminds me of like the gap or bed bath and beyond it reminds me of like rich yuppies driving around in their fancy suvs listening to this music like wasn't it great i'm gonna go have a chai latte i understand i think i understand what you're talking about because like in the u.s like soccer is like more of a middle class thing so i think anybody in the u.s that likes oasis they they or likes like football they're being a bit like poncy aren't they but oasis is from uh, from council estates you know, these are not the like nicest people you ever meet. They're either going to be in the rock and roll band or be like criminals, you know, <laughs> you know, just stealing stuff, you know. And they just um, they just brought that attitude to being in a band, which a lot of bands are. And it's not it's not. But like uh, always, like Noel said, it's a universal. They're not Britpop. They're a universal rock band and they wanted to be massive. So and he's a good songwriter. So he wrote those songs to be massive. But they also like Guns N' Roses. They have the singles, but you also have like Supersonic. You also have like uh, Morning Glory. You have all the attitude. You know, you have like um, Columbia on the on the debut album. There's it's a rock and roll album with with Live Forever. With Live Forever is the single. That's it. The whole album, like cigarettes and an- alcohol, is a like a massive like song live that's it the singles aren't really what the band are about it's like guns and roses you know they have like november rain but everybody likes them because of appetite for destruction so i don't know how well, they are you some fan? people can do this they can write songs Noel can write songs and he's more calculated and he wants to be massive and rich you know and he can do it and liam is like completely unfiltered idiot you know what i mean but everybody relates to them are you a UK. fan wasted? I think, like I said, I bought Definitely Maybe and then I liked it. I didn't buy what, What's the Story, Morning Glory. And I didn't buy Be Here Now because it was everywhere. You go in the pub and all the songs that you're talking about, like Champagne Supernova, every, it was on the radio 24-7. They were playing the albums on the radio like every day. You heard, I'd heard all of like What's the Story, Morning Glory without buying the CD, you know? But I don't identify with them because they're from Burnish, you know, and they would hate me. They go, you're a fucking student cunt. You know what I mean? So, you know, it's, it's a, you know, I can't really relate to them, but you kind of, 
it, it's like um, it's like Guns N' Roses. I don't think I'm like Guns N' Roses, you know, as people. You know, oh. they're more like they're like it's like Arnold Schwarzenegger or something. It's kind of like a fantasy. But Oasis, Oasis. did it really well in in the UK. I completely anyway. disagree with you. You are so Guns N' Roses, you don't even know. You're an alcoholic. So guess what? You, Slash, Duff, Axel, oh, you're all good on there. And buddy, between me and you, buddy, and hitting the buffet table, me, you, with Slash, and Axel, dude, we could put a fucking hurting on an all you can eat buffet, all right? If they would see us come in, they'd be like, oh, fuck this, all right? So I think yeah, you got a lot in common there. Liars, like what about you? Like, I'm not abused like from like a Midwestern town with a load of rednecks. It's not how, It's not where I grew up. So I don't have that kind of. The point with Oasis is, is that, that being in a band was their only choice. Like their dads were on the dole, and they they signed on with their dads on on welfare on the dole. So you know, cigarettes and alcohol. That's what it's about. You know, that's all they've got. So I don't have that level of desperation. I was kind of like lower middle class. So I always think I could just get a job. <laughs> Turns out you can't get a job, but <laughs> liars. I'm here. What's up? Well, we'd like to know your opinion of Oasis and what we've been discussing for the last few minutes. I am a fan. Uh, I often think back of the song, you know what I mean, and listening to uh, the, so that was their um, that was their first single off uh, that massive album. Um, uh, Be here now. Yeah, so this was the next album, um, and it was the first s- single off that album, and it was like the big comeback for Oasis, and it was like this seven-minute long song. And I always remember an interview. Um, which which brother's the fucked up brother? Uh, Liam like the is asshole. the singer. Liam is the cocky one and just talks talks a lot of shit. Barely makes okay. sense, but it's funny. And who's the one that that plays guitar? They both Noel do, is eh? the guitar is the songwriter. Okay, so Noel- so Noel Gallagher was doing a was doing an interview, and he said that when they were in the studio, he was doing so much cocaine that he just kept adding layers and layers and yeah. layers on the beginning of "Do You Know What I Mean?" And it's like he says he listens to it now, and it's just this absolute mess of a song, but it sounds great to me. And yeah, yeah he it's said he kind was of doing- it's kind of like that's the album that they went to with America this huge like overproduced album yeah and yeah and they and they were an absolute mess when they went to america they could barely finish a tour i mean they yeah. they were they were basically like doing the cocaine thing properly i remember like yeah. uh, like liam that's when he was like dating patsy kenzie or whatever but i remember him saying that in when he was at home or on, on the road he had like he had two pints of jack daniels one on one side of the bed and one on the other side <laughs> but yeah that's what that the Australia and also what I picked up recently listening is that they used to do interviews at like 4 a.m. in the morning in America and in Australia and stuff, and they were completely fucked up. And after they got huge, none of them wanted to do the interviews. So when they went, they the 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 road manager like Robertson, he's been like talking a lot. Uh, he has a really good book about it. Um, he was saying that he couldn't get them out of bed, and so when they went down for these interviews. They were normally like very, very like having huge hangovers or come downs. So they were being extra specially cunty. And that, I think, in America didn't go over that well. They just came across as very, very arrogant and very aggressive and acting as if they're tough. But if you watched interviews from the early days, when you first met them, they weren't so cocky. It was just Noel saying Supersonic and Live Forever are like, great songs and we're going to be huge and Liam was like a 19 year old kid but if you just met them at the be here now period you just think who are these fucking cocksuckers you know because remember one thing like, I like uh, about them Screaming Trees remember Screaming Trees Mark Lanigan like they were on some festival with them and Liam was like he, they, uh, Screaming Trees said something about Oasis being shit or whatever the American opinion is and Liam stood on the side of the stage in the in the view of the the crowd of the Screaming Trees fans or the festival crowd and just stood there watching Mark Lanigan do their set, like kind of like eyeballing him and being a cunt. And then Mark Lanigan like did this really long, like, you know, uh, 
kind of like almost like a poem about how how untough Liam was and how how Oasis were pussies. You know, it's on YouTube. You know, it's, it's all about how Mark Langan is tough. You know, and how he's going to beat the shit out of them. But he doesn't understand that they're just having a laugh. That's just what they're like. You know what I mean? One thing so I really like about them stuff. is the fact that they they hate each other. Like. The other day on Twitter, one of them, uh, one of the brothers said to the other one, "Hey, unblock me. There's something I gotta tell you. It's important." So he unblocked him, and the next brother, the other brother, responded by saying, "Bitch." <laughs> yeah, I think that's funny. I remember there was another time where one of the brothers, and I, I don't know which one, so you guys can correct me here, but one of the brothers was performing, and the other brother was uh, heckling him from like the audience, like he was above at a venue, like in the balcony, and he was just heckling the other brother as he performed. I think that's hilarious. I love that that's they like, hate each other. That's MTV Unplugged. Like, Liam Liam was kind of threatened that Noel can basically do the band without him, but he can't really. So at the MTV Unplugged, Liam didn't want to do it because it's like acoustic. So I think he, he got he got, ang- he got pissed off about doing it and went and sat in the audience and then was heckling them. Another time, Liam just, like, sat down on stage for one of the songs throughout the whole song and wouldn't sing. Because Noel was like criticizing. Him. Noel is like the enforcer in the band, if you know what I mean. He's the one going around, like uh, criticizing everybody's performance and stuff. Uh, but I think like Noel was saying it in an interview on a sort of chat show. This is like after. This is way. This is recently, or you know, way past they'd split up. He was saying that in you know, like in their family, like their pe- their dad used to beat the shit out of them, you know. That's basically, and not, and Liam and Noel were saying that, you know, you know, that's just what it was like, you know, in the 70s. You know, I wasn't different from anybody else, you know. And when their dad finally left them, you know, it, Noel was basically Liam's dad. So Liam always thinks of Noel as being like the authority figure. They both don't really like authority that much, but he was saying that, you know, Liam doesn't like to be told what to do by his his old his brother his younger brother so they're always having these fights about who's the most important in the band like i'm gonna leave you know and then you'll be fucked but noel is saying it's all about music and then like sibling rivalry there's a, a record like an ep or something with them just arguing for like an hour and it's basically like liam saying that you know they got thrown off a ferry uh, you know they got thrown off a ferry for like for basically fighting on a ferry liam and the band and Noel wasn't there or something. And Liam was saying, you know, it, you know, it's part of rock and roll. You know, it's it's rock and roll. And and Noel was saying, no, rock and roll is, you know, going to your gig, playing it, and being the best band in the world. It's all about music. So they spent like an hour arguing about, you know, and then, you know, and at one point, like Liam was saying, you know, you know, Lennon used to like, you know, burn around just doing like mad shit and stuff. And then Noel was saying like. What you think you're? You think you're John Lennon? He goes, no, I didn't say that. I'm saying, <laughs> you know what I mean? These kind of these arguments is what they were talking about all the time. But when Liam got frustrated because Noel is probably like smarter than him and more of a twat, in the end, Liam was getting physical with him. So throughout those tours, they would get into fights. And I think the the reason why they they broke up is because Liam got one of like Noel's guitars and like almost like smashed him he was swinging it around and he almost hit noel in the head so noel quit but he quit many times before you know but i think noel is like winding him up you know what i mean but neither of them will give give a give any leeway to the other because they're brothers you know what i mean it would be really gay if they just liked each other you know? there's chris robinson and uh rich robinson rich, is robinson. rich robinson the rich black robinson. rose and also uh, Jesus and Mary Chain are brothers, the Reed brothers. But I think it's a weird thing to be in a band with your brother. You know? It's like, how do you... What's that, that newish band? They're all brothers. They all hate each other. Is it Alma? Hanson? Alma No, 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 no. They're like a rock band. Um, uh, Hanson. They're like... No, 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 no not Hanson. Yeah, there's that one. But there's a more indie band called like uh, the Al- Alma Matters or something. The Jackson Five. <laughs> all their, they're they're like popular now, or they had a few oh, years ago. Man. They had a big hit. Um, oh, the Jonas Brothers. 
No, it, they're a rock band. <sighs> the Everly Brothers. No, they're. Well, I'll find out. Um, there was that band of Christians, or kind of like they were like uh, Amish or something. They were an indie American indie rock band, a little bit like the Killers or something. I'm sure they were brothers. I don't know. I, I, I like their sibling rivalry. I remember I used to watch so-called celebrity death match on uh, MTV, where it was Claymation, and they had Lowell, or <laughs> Liam versus Noel Gallagher in a fucking celebrity death match, and it was hilarious. I, I enjoy the fact that they hate each other. And that's like, I, I want to get Wasted's prediction. Like, do you actually think this tour is going to happen for more than a few dates? Because I can see these two assholes just going at it. Like, maybe they play a few shows, but after a few shows, one of them is going to be a fucking cunt. I think what though, like I've seen like uh, Liam these days, he's like 50 now, I think. And he's like turned into more of like an adult, like he's a man now. Uh, <laughs> like, <he's> and, a... <laughs> like when he was like, a, it, when he was in Oasis, he was like a, a kid, you know, he was just like an arrogant 20 something. Now he's like a 50 year old, you know. I, yeah. But now he's, now he's have, got about another 30 years of drinking behind him. So, I mean, you know, the alcoholism and, uh, you know, the rage. And if you have a sibling rivalry that's been going on this long, that's going to, you know, if you've ever been at a Thanksgiving dinner with siblings that don't get along well, it doesn't really last that long before shit goes down. I don't think they're going to get on, but I don't think he's going to be going to turn to violence. Another thing with the, which reminds me is that he now, uh, Liam, I think he has like Hashimoto's disease or something. He's an autoimmunity disease so he's he's like looking after his health now up until very le- recently like even through his solo work he is still like you know getting in trouble and fighting and stuff so but i think he's got like a health problem that he, i mean he goes to bed at like 7 30 at night now he was saying and you know he wakes up at four uh, and liam and uh, noel also said that you know he's 50 you know and he doesn't and he's 57 now or something and he doesn't think he's going to live that long so i think part of the i mean the reunion is obviously just set up because it's on the same it's announced on the same day as the you know the release of uh definitely maybe in 94 you know they're all they're all business for sure you know they've got a whole team of people behind them that know what they're doing but they just it's a bit like the guns and roses they they they, these but two, Guns N' Roses doesn't have a team behind them that knows what they're doing. <laughs> if Guns N' Roses were fighting, then this would be better. I mean, if Axel and Slash were back being pissed off at each other and, you know, Matt Axel would be great again. I, I don't like this fucking happy Axel. I mean, I'm, I'm happy for him in his personal life and that he's in a better place mentally, but damn it, he's not as entertaining anymore. We haven't got a good Axel rant in years. I mean, good Lord, can we go back to Slash as the devil and that he's been, you know, replaced by, uh, you know, when he died, his soul left his body and that he's like a, a lizard person now. He's not a real person anymore. I mean, that's hilarious. I, I, I miss the old Axel and Slash feuding with each other on stage where, you know, Axel gets up there, says a shitty comment, Slash is all pissed off the rest of the shows. Better music, better times. I think with uh, Oasis, you're going to get that, where these assholes are going to get drunk. They're going to go on, they're going to do a few shows, and then they're just going to start fighting again. No, they'll definitely still be fighting, uh, you know, like bantering backwards and forwards continuously, you know, especially once they get on tour. But I don't think Liam is as, as, you know, Liam is unfiltered. He doesn't seem as as unfiltered and he doesn't see he's not on cocaine anymore. You know, they I mean, in in the US, one of their first shows in the US, I think it was New York. Uh, the Liam sort of got the whole band on crystal meth, so they when they played the show he couldn't he couldn't even sing, so so Noel was so angry about it because he was all about like breaking America, he took all the money from the bands like uh, Kitty and flew to like I think it was like Las Las Vegas and holed up in a in a in a hotel room with a, all the all the cocaine he could find you know, and they they lost him for a bit in America, so it did. That's, you know, and that's what Liam was saying. That's rock and roll, you know. But if you're living with somebody like that all the time, you know, who every day is going to be causing, getting everybody at it, as they say, going into hotels, being a twat, throwing furniture around. (laughs) I don't know. But yeah, I think Noel had a bit of a job and he just lasted a certain amount of time and then he just couldn't take it anymore. You know, he's also worried about like, Liam like dying 
So as, easy. as it right now, there's only, they're doing five cities and a total of 14 shows. So they're not. Yeah. It's it's not a huge tour as it stands right now. No. In Wem- Wembley, they're they're adding dates as they go along in all these places like Australia and Wembley. In Wembley, the idea is that they've got five or something, and they want. And I think Taylor Swift did eight at the new Wembley, so they're trying to do ten. You know, 14 million okay. people. 14 million people are trying to buy tickets. Like I think it was yesterday, and there's only like one million tickets. And all the all the websites are crashing, and also there's a big scalping problem because people are buying tickets and then putting them online for six grand. So yeah, tickets were upwards of uh, eight thousand euros as of yesterday. Uh, if you're buying a ticket online, supposedly people are trying to sell them for six thousand uh, pounds. Yeah. But if you're buying a sort of seating ticket, it's only seventy three pounds. And in the UK, if you're buying I would say like a standing, a proper ticket, like where you're standing and you can be down the front. It's like two hundred dollars. So uh, they're all sold out. Every single ticket for every single show is now officially sold out. Yeah, there's which there's, is crazy. There's like I was listening to like sports radio yesterday in the UK, Talk Sport, and they were doing a bit about they were trying to call the ticket line. <laughs> it's basically saying you're like eight thousand in the queue. Uh, you know, please hold. <laughs> There's 14 million people trying to buy tickets for one, one or two million tickets. You know, and it's strange though because like at the time you think America hated Oasis, and then there were people in the UK that hated Oasis as well. They were like the new Eminem or something that were a bad influence on people. But now, like all Dave Grohl really likes Oasis, The Killers, all these bands, and uh, I've seen on YouTube, not like recently, but like in the last few years, they've all been saying how amazing Oasis are. They're basically they're just like men. ACDC or um, Motorhead. They just make the same album again. Sounds a bit like the Beatles. It's a bit, it's got a like little a, bit of a, like a Stonesy kind of attitude. Wasted. I think we might have figured it out. Hey, Liars, was the band yeah. you thinking of that had brothers in it? Was it ACDC? No, it was Kings of Leon. <laughs> yeah, that's the one I was thinking of. Kings of Leon. They're like Christian rock band or something. Yeah, they, so, they all hate each other. It's three brothers and a cousin. And and they had to go on hiatus because they hate each other. <laughs> well, Chris Robinson and uh, uh, Rich is it Rich Robinson? They hate yeah, each other too. They hated each other too. But they're back together now. They 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 yeah. just uh, released a new album actually not that long ago. <sighs> well, I I just think this has been great. Wasted's really taken us a deep dive down Oasis, and we find out that Wires loves him so Oasis, some Oasis, and I just find it amusing when the two idiots fight. So, congratulations, folks. You're going to get Oasis for how long? Who knows? But it's going to happen in 2025. Um, yeah, just else wait until 2026 for tickets. <laughs> Don't pay six grand online because those tickets are being cancelled. <laughs> if you buy a six thousand, a six grand ticket, then you're not going to be able to get into the show. That's what they're saying. If anybody so anyone listens to the show. Is it? No one ever listens to our show, so I mean, come on. <laughs> <Yeah>. uh, <laughs> it's a reunion show. Yeah. So, uh, do we have anything else we want to talk about on, on Oasis? Or we're going to move on to the next topic. I'm good on Oasis. Cigarettes and alcohol. <laughs> all right. So I speak waste. That means he's good. Um, all right. So the next topic this evening, folks, and uh, Lars, I'm going to give you time to go look in the chat about. Uh, so we got our dear friend and favorite maybe our favorite actor from the show uh nicholas cage we love us some nick cage and he's going to be starring in a new movie playing john madden so yes, sir. that's gonna I, I don't know if that's miscast though i mean i love nick cage but i don't i don't see him as john madden i just think that's like john goodman should have been john madden yeah i can see john goodman for sure you know is 100%. is is Nicolas Cage going to go the the Brendan Fraser route and put on a fat suit? You know, because, I mean, John Madden was a big guy. Nicolas Cage isn't that overly big, right? So, so I don't know if it, he's going to be playing, like, the 70s version of John Madden or he's going to be playing, like, the 90s announcer and starting the video game with the licensing John Madden. Like, what are we talking about here? Are we talking about 
even in the 70s, he was still about 300 pounds when he was coaching the Raiders. According to the article uh, from Variety magazine, uh, it's going to focus on 1970s John Madden uh, with the Oakland Raiders. Al Davis and the owner of the Raiders and yeah, all that. Now, it's yeah. funny. If you look at Al Davis and you look at Nicolas Cage, they look alike each other. But Nicolas Cage looks nothing like John Madden. I agree. It's it's kind of a an interesting choice of actor. I I like Nicolas Cage. Don't get me wrong. I think he's I think he's good. I don't think he's great. I think he's definitely good. Oh, fuck you. He's interesting. He's he's interesting. I'll give you that. He's a good actor. Don't get me wrong. He's he's very good. Is he gonna wear um, a wig? Is he gonna wear a wig? Like, is he gonna? Does yeah. John Madden have hair? On mm-hmm. his head. Yeah, John John Madden has hair. Does Nick, Nicholas Cage always look bald from the beginning? Oh no, John Madden's got a nice night. He had a nice bushy uh, uh, set of hair, nice parted uh, white hair. And when he was in his younger days, it was parted brown. And uh, you know, but here's the deal: John Madden was about six five, three fifty, and yeah. uh, Nick Cage is not a uh, six five, nor is he three hundred fifty pounds. I just. Uh, I don't get the casting choice. Now, I love Nick Cage. I mean, I'll pretty much watch anything Nick Cage is in because Nick Cage makes me believe. All right? Like, anything I see Nick Cage in, I'm like, all right, Nick Cage is in this. I'm going to give it a shot because, you know, he delivers. Um, but yeah, I'm not, the casting choice is kind of odd. So you guys are kind of agreeing with me on that? Do you think Matt Damon would be better? You I know what? I, Matt Damon? I think, I think I Brasky nailed John it. Madden I think John Goodman. Like. John Goodman. John Goodman would Is be perfect, still alive? but Matt Damon. Oh yeah, Isn't John, John Goodman, Goodman like uh, John Candy too. <laughs> no, but uh, R.I.P. John Candy. Uh, John Candy would have been absolutely perfect, but uh, Goodman's still alive. But you know, Matt Damon's not a bad option. You know, you add about fifty pounds to Matt Damon. He's got, you know, he's got the look. He's got the, you know, he, he resembles John Madden more. I can see that. I mean, he's not tall enough by any means, but you know, I I could see it. It's better than Nick Cage, I think. I think this is a very poorly cast role, but it leads us into our next topic. Unless you guys have anything more on the Nick Cage playing John Madden. No. Well, I know Wasted doesn't, so we're going we're gonna to go into this. The 2024 NFL season is upon us. Now, our last episode we did was about uh, European football, and uh, we got censored pretty bad on it. So I'm not going to say, but it's in the episode title of our last episode. So we're now we're going to talk some American football, some good old pigskin. And uh, American football is like the best time of the year for us Americans. It's like the one thing that we get to distract ourselves with from the rest of the shit of the world. And uh, the upcoming season's happening. Uh, me and Liars fall football a lot. Uh, Wasted has no fucking idea. So this is going to be great. So what we're going to do now is we're going to do our official playoff predictions. We're going to pick the Super Bowl, like which two teams are going to be in the Super Bowl and which one's going to win. Now, Wasted, we're not going to have you do playoff predictions because we don't think you know enough teams in the NFL to do that. But I, we think you know enough teams to pick a Super Bowl. So, Wasted, which two teams are going to make it to the Super Bowl? Uh, uh, I used to follow Miami Dolphins and Green Bay Packers. So, okay, I so we got Dan Marino will be at the Super Bowl. <laughs> so, we got, we got Wasted going with the Green Bay Packers and the Miami Dolphins. Wasted, who's winning the Super Bowl? Miami Dolphins or the Green Bay Packers? Uh, I'm going with the Packers. All right, so Wasted's got Jordan Love winning his first Super Bowl this year. So that's going to be Wasted's official pick. Now, Liars, me and you are going to go a little bit more in depth than this, all right? Are you ready? Just, yeah, just just as uh, the the Packers and, 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 and the Dolphins are both in the NFC, so they'll never meet in the Super Bowl. But uh, Okay, first off, you're Canadian. Um, yes. The Dolphins are in the AFC. And the Packers are in the NFC. I, I, I'm looking at it right now. And you're they're both, they're smoking crack. The you to stop. They're both in the um, NFC. Hey, liars. Yeah. Uh, I've been a football fan my my pretty much my whole life, and uh, the Miami Dolphins have always been in the AFC East. Uh, they've been in the same division as the New England Patriots, and the Packers have always been in the NFC, and the uh, Packers played the Patriots in the Super Bowl, and we got our ass kicked by the Packers, and they beat us with Brett Favre. Um, I can 100% tell you right now that the Green Bay Packers are in the NFC. 
and I that the Miami that, Dolphins are in the AFC. I think the Miami Dolphins played the Packers in one of the Super Bowls. That I what when I was like 14, I I watched that Super Bowl on TV when I was following no, the NFL. The Packers, no, the Packers Packers stopped playing in Super Bowls at the end of the 60s, and then didn't make it back until Brett Favre until the late 90s or mid 90s when they beat the Patriots in 96 and they lost okay. to the Broncos in 97. Oh yeah, Denver Broncos. My friend you like the Denver Broncos. And I well, like I'm Packers. concerned about liars because he's thinking that the Miami Dolphins are an NFC team. But you know what? You're right. You're right. I, I I clicked I just clicked on it because I wanted to have the graph in front of me. I wanted to make sure I had all the correct divisions and teams in the divisions. And for whatever reason, this fucking graph that I'm looking at has the Packers in the NFC North. So. Uh, so they in, are in the in, NFC in, North. It's, I meant the AFC North, sorry. In the AFC North, yeah. when they're actually in the NFC North. So I've clicked on a different graphic, and I, I have the correct teams now. I'm sorry. Um, okay. Do apologize, right. so, Wasted. So, so here we go, folks. So Wasted's picking the Green Bay Packers to beat the Miami Dolphins in the Super Bowl. So if you got your betting money now, he's going to kind of be like our, you know, the animal they have on the TV news that picks the winning Super Bowl. That's that's wasted for us. So, uh, folks, get your uh, get your bets in with your bookies or your online gambling apps, even though we don't endorse that. But uh, hey, if you have a gambling problem, there's a one eight hundred line you can look up on Google because we ain't going to fucking tell you because we don't know. We're men. We don't have a gambling problem. Um, all right, so we're gonna let's go over this. So in the AFC, buddy. I'm looking right now. So who do you got winning the AFC East? The AFC, I the, hate Bills. The, the Bills. You got the Bills winning. Yeah. I am going to say the AFC East, and this fucking hurts me to say it, and I don't want to say it. I believe the Dolphins are going to win the AFC East. I could see that. I do. I do. I think the Dolphins are going to win. Uh, my Patriots. God, God, I love my Patriots, but uh, our fucking offensive line is horrifically bad this year. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I think we might – one or two things are going to happen. Either we're going to be a nine or to ten win team, or we're only going to win like three to five games. It's one yeah. or the other. I, I don't, I don't know which one it is, but Super Bowls ain't happening this year. You also got the New York Jets in the division, but uh, supposedly Aaron Rodgers is being a complete prick, and it's all, it's very dysfunctional. And they're the Jets, so why even bother? Uh, when it comes to the Buffalo Bills, I'm not even picking them to make the playoffs this year. Josh Allen lost a lot of his offensive weapons this year. Uh, Stephon Diggs is now on the Texans. Um, Gabe Davis is gone. I, I just, I, I just don't see it with the Bills this year. I don't think they're even going to make it. So you're going to go with the Bills, and I'm going with the Dolphins. The next division we're talking about is the AFC North. Um, who do you got, buddy? The Mike Mike Piazza. The popular pick is going to be the Baltimore Ravens, but I think if Joe Burrow stays healthy, the Bengals. I'm going to go with the Baltimore Ravens. And uh, I'm I'm gonna pick as one of my wild card teams because we get three wild card teams from each conference. I'm gonna take the Bengals as one of my wild card teams. Yeah, fair, fair, good call. All right, the next division we're gonna move on to now is gonna be the AFC South. This is an interesting one. There's there's a lot of good, not great teams. Actually, all four teams. Well, maybe not Tennessee, but um, I don't know who are you picking. Uh, I'm going the Texans. I mean, they made it last year. They yeah. won in convincing fashion. Um, the Jaguars are an interesting team. They might be one of my choices for the wild card, but I don't know yet. I'm gonna. I'm. I think I'm gonna. I'm gonna focus more on the West in the wild card than I am on the on the uh, the Jaguars right now, just because. <sighs> Trevor Lawrence has been a disappointment. He hasn't been sure has. the next Peyton Manning. He hasn't been the next Andrew Luck. He, he's been good, but he hasn't been great. So I'm going to go yeah. with the Texans. You? In the Texans as well. Yeah. CJ right. Stroud. All right. Hey, sadly, we have to move on to the AFC West. Probably my least favorite division in the NFL. Oh, fuck them all is what I say, but we, yeah. we, we got to do it. Uh, Casey. I, I hate to say it because I fucking hate Patrick Mahomes and I fucking yeah. hate Travis Kelsey. I hate Travis Kelsey with a passion, but uh, we got to go Kansas City. So I got Bengals as one of my wild card teams. Uh, I guess 
I guess I'm going to pick the Bills as one of my wild card teams. Um, so I got Bengals, Bills. Ah, do I want to do this? Do I want? Uh, I'm going to go with the Jets as my third wild card team, and I don't nice. like doing that. But nice. yeah, Bengals, Bills, Jets as my wild card teams, and that's our div- You see, in our division winners, my division winners are Miami, Baltimore, Kansas City, and uh, Houston. So I got the Bills, the Bengals, the Texans, and the Chiefs as the division winners. And my three wild cards are definitely going to be the Ravens, the Dolphins, and a bit of a sleeper pick. I'm going to go the Colts. You know, that's if Anthony Richardson can stay healthy, I can see that. I really can because the division's not great. Tennessee's really beat the shit this year. Uh, Jacksonville isn't the powerhouse that people want to think they are. Um, I can see that, but let's, let's move on now to the NFC. Uh, so we got the NFC East first. Um, do you want me to go first or do you want to go? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, boy, I, I don't want to say this, but I guess I'll just do it. I'm going to take the Dallas Cowboys one of the NFC East. I think so too. With the, with the Eagles very close on their heels. I'm not buying the Eagles this year. I think they're going to miss Saquon, the playoffs. I think Saquon's going to going to change that team. He's going to add uh, exactly what they need, what they've been missing. So. All right. Well, next up, we're going to be heading to the NFC North. I'm going to go with the Detroit Lions winning it. Yeah. And I got the Green Bay Packers as a wild card team. I got the Lions winning it as well. Um, I think the Bears are going to make some noise this year, though. Um, maybe maybe that's just me being hopeful, uh, but I think the Bears might do something this year. All right. Our next division here is going to be the NFC South. Uh, I'm taking the Tampa Bay Buccaneers to win the NFC South. Um, I don't see any wild card teams coming out of the NFC South. Uh, Buccaneers for me too, 100%. Uh, the rest, the other teams, with the exception of maybe Atlanta, they might might cause some noise early on in the city, in, in the season. But at the end of the day, it's the Buccaneers. All right. The next one we go to the NFC West. I'm going to go with the San Francisco 49ers winning the division. I'm going to take the Rams as a wild card team. I'm exactly the same. San Fran and the Rams. Um, I think the Cardinals are Kyler Murray. I don't know. I don't know about him. Um, and of course, the Seahawks aren't much. They're ever since uh, uh, what's his face left. They haven't been doing much. So I'm going to go San Fran, and I can see the Rams as a as a wild card as well. Well, it, well, here's where it gets interesting here. So, how many wild card teams do you have? So far, just the Rams. All right. So I got the Rams and I got the uh, Packers. I need to come up with one more wild card team. It's it's kind of a tough choice this year. You know, you were mentioning the Bears earlier. Right? Is that someone that you you're thinking about taking? Well, maybe. So. I definitely have the Rams making it into the playoffs and I definitely have the Eagles as a second wild card and it's a toss up between Green Bay and Chicago for for the third for me. I'm going to take as my third, I'm going to take the Saints. I I know I said the South, no, but I'm going to take the Saints. So now we get to the fun part. We're not going to go, you know, because we don't know how the playoff brackets are going to break down, but we're going to go our two Super Bowl teams. Um. So liars, I uh, I live this way. Do you want to take uh, who you who you got going for your Super Bowl? From the AFC, I have the Bills, and then from the NFC, I have Detroit. For the AFC, I have the Ravens. For the NFC, I have Detroit. Nice. So I got Detroit finally winning this bitch this year and beating the Ravens. If you. I can see Detroit winning the Super Bowl this year. I want the Bills to win. I like the Bills. I'm a Bills fan. But I, I think Detroit is going to do it this year. 
Yeah, I think it's Detroit's year. I mean, I could change Baltimore out for, you know, the Dolphins if they could actually win in cold weather. Or I could, I, I'd hate to say Kansas City. I think Kansas City, uh, their wideouts are really weak this year. Um, you know what? I'm actually going to change it out. I, I don't know. No, I'm going to stay with the Lions winning. I'm just not 100% sold on Baltimore. I can see Cincinnati or Miami sneaking into that spot with Baltimore. But that's kind of our predictions right now. You know what? Fuck it. I'm going to take Cincinnati and Detroit. Fuck that. Let's do it this the real way. Let's go the Bengals. Let's go the Bengals and the Lions, and I'm still taking the Lions winning. I think it's just a Lions year this year. Uh, They should have won it last year. They should have beat the 49ers, and I think they would have destroyed. uh, Time for uh, Casey. Yeah, Casey, I just don't think it's hard to do, you know, repeat. They've already repeated twice, and, uh, you know, right now – you know, doing a three-peat, and I don't see it happening. Now, mind you, we mean you both have the Lions winning. And our dear friend Wasted has the Packers winning. Come on. What are we going to do when Wasted wins? We're going to have to give him some serious props because, um, like you said, if you're a betting man, get call your bookie right now because the odds are pretty long on Green Bay winning the Super Bowl this year. It'd be the complete yeah. Wasted pick, too. Absolutely. It's a long shot. Wasted <laughs> everything in your life's been a long shot. You're a long shot. Look at you. Look how successful you are. Just gallivanting around 7-Eleven right now. Yeah, drinking beer at 9 a.m. in <laughs> in Southeast Asia. Some people, that's a lot better than the current predicament that they're in right now in the world. You know, we're we're staying away from current events and political topics and everything else, but there's a lot worse places than you could be than drinking beer in Southeast Asia at, you know, 9 a.m. in the morning. Just saying. You can wait for a lifetime to spend your days in the sunshine. <laughs> I'm telling you, the Wasted Travel Agency, we're, we're really missing the boat on this one. Is there anything else you want to talk about tonight, Wasted? Uh, nope. I don't think so. Liars? It's okay. We can talk about anything you want to talk about. No, just, you know, current events we're staying away from, but uh, rest in peace, Johnny Gaudreau. That was uh, tragic what happened. That's a sad, oh. sad story. Let's do some RIPs. I mean, Johnny Hockey, great, great hockey player from New Jersey, uh, spent his time over at Boston College, uh, later joined the Calgary Flames, and then ended up with the Columbus Blue Jackets, if I'm correct. Just an outstanding hockey player. Him and his brother were tragically killed by a drunk driver. Um Hey, guys, you know, everyone has a couple beers and this and that. Just be cognizant, you know, try to get a safe ride home. You don't want to fuck up your whole life because you decide to have too many beers and drive. I mean, simple as that. I mean, the guy who did it seems to be an asshole. Um, The news came out that he was all offended that, you know, he wasn't going to get bail after he just, you know, drunk drove and killed two people. Uh, Johnny Goudeau's brother, Matthew, was expecting a uh, baby here in the next four months. Uh, They both were fathers. They both were husbands. Um, Just completely tragic. Uh, It sucks. You know, obviously thoughts and prayers out to the family. Uh, Just try to be responsible, guys, when you're driving and you're on the road. Just understand you don't want to, you know, one mistake on your part to really, number one, change some innocent person's life by you making a mistake. And number two, really fucking up your whole life on something that you can avoid. Uh, Drinking and driving is not a great thing. And uh, try to avoid it at all costs, guys. On top of that, we lost another person this past week, and I know the episode will probably be out in a week or two, so it's kind of be old news. But uh, we lost a great wrestler, Psycho Sid, Sid Vicious, and man, did I fucking love this guy. I don't know if you guys watch professional wrestling, but Psycho Sid fucking ruled. Sid Vicious, yep. I mean, absolutely. That's when wrestling was wrestling. He was six foot nine, three hundred pounds, master of the power bomb, come out choke slam you, uh, you know, just. And from all accounts, was a really pretty decent guy. You know, they had that incident with Varn Anderson over in uh, Europe where uh, they got into the match with, uh, you know, them stabbing each other. And then he got into a fight with Brian Pillman back in the day with a squeegee. But, you know, he was also part of one of the funniest wrestling botches of all time with the Shockmaster debut and falling through the wall. And just Sid Vicious brought a lot of good memories to a lot of professional wrestling fans. So, you know, rest in peace, Sid Vicious. And, uh, you know, Psycho said, hopefully your family and this and that, you know, thoughts and prayers to them. But, man, a lot of fucking people are dying these days. Like, every time, like, all these celebrities that we grew up with and love, they're all just fucking dying. It's yeah. 
it's sad, man. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, I don't know. Hug your family, you know? It's because you never know when it's going to happen, right? So you never know when anything's going to happen in this yeah. world anymore. Don't don't let the moments, you know, where you can, you know, show the people around you that you love them, your friends, your your family. Just make sure you're nicer. Try to, you know, spread joy and love in this world, and not one, try to, one, you know, make people laugh. One thing that was done, uh, so Humboldt, that was the big bus crash up here in Canada a few years ago where the the whole junior hockey team basically died. Uh, one one tradition, excuse me, one tradition that was started was uh, putting their hockey sticks outside. So it, for Johnny Hockey, Johnny Gaudreau, put your hockey stick outside. That's basically meant to 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 say, hey boys, you, know, you can put, you're welcome here and uh, rest in peace and there's hockey sticks out there for you to play, right? So um, they that did that note, for the kids. Yeah. Yeah, no, man, I just think that's beautiful. And uh, on that note, I don't think there's a better way to end the show than, you know, showing our respect and trying to spread a little bit of love in this world that's so fucked up and hurt right now. So, um, hey, guys, the next couple of weeks, next couple of months, it's all going to be crazy in the world. Try to uh, avoid social media. Try to avoid the noise. Try to find the good spots in the day. Try to find happiness. Get outside. The fall's coming here. The weather's going to get a hell of a lot nicer. The leaves are going to change. Fucking football's back. Um, just spend some time with your family. Appreciate the things you have now. You never know how long you're going to have them. And, uh, you know, we're not all here forever. And uh, thank you for listening to us. I really want to say that to the audience. We, we noticed the comments. We're sorry that our, uh, we've had a little bit of a break in uh uploading episodes we've just been busy i've had some personal matters to deal with with family health issues and uh we're just trying to navigate the waters in a crazy fucking world right now with uh what we can put up on the show we don't we're not trying to offend anyone or cause any bullshit or any of that nonsense we're just trying to make people laugh talk some music talk some uh, nostalgia and uh bring to you an overall program that you enjoy so i think that's the best I can say. Uh, obviously, we're going to keep doing this, and uh, we enjoy doing it. Uh, Wasted, thank you so much. And Liars, you know what to do. Please. Live Absolutely. forever. <laughs> what did you say, Wasted? Live forever. You're going to live forever? Yeah. I'll live forever. You and I. Yeah, with all the thanks. alcohol in your system, you're probably fermented, you bastard. Thanks for listening, everybody. You can find us on YouTube. Uh, find us on Rumble. You can find us on Spotify, uh, everywhere where you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening on the other platforms. I do check the numbers, and it's very encouraging to see that people aren't just watching on YouTube uh, and the, the more mainstream ones, but some of the other ones as well. So we appreciate everybody that listens. Hit like and subscribe. Leave a comment. Uh, what you like about the show, what you don't like about Ladies the show. Ladies and gentlemen, but, uh, favor shame, our next note, contestant... William Angio! <laughs> All right, come on. We got, we got a show to do. You really suck, dude. Wait a second. Lovely. How could I suck? I host a talent show. All right, I'm on national television, and I get paid a lot. All right, and I get chicks. Here, smell. No, God. Uh, all right. Oh, sorry, that was the sandwich. Smell. No, I don't oh, okay. want to smell your food. She wasn't even that fat. All right, so I'm not gay. All right, whatever. Let's get to it, okay? I am so desperate to hear you sing. I mean, last time you were fantastic. Uh, so you're going to do uh, a Love Fist classic, right? It was number one in Germany for 19 weeks. I'm sure you'll be fine. Are you ready? Um, yes, I am. All right, it's favor shame for William Angio. <laughs> Sector!
Take a break before we hear from the judges and find out if that was fame or shame. Whew, what do you guys think? You want to come see my trailer later? Come on. Awkward. Come on.